Tiffany can probably tell you this. One of the things that is true about teaching is the thing that you repeat over and over again is the thing you want to make sure that people take away. They're not going to take everything away. So whatever you repetitively enforce, that's what they're going to take away. Some of you probably have noticed that I am a highly repetitive person. That's why. And as I read the Gospel of John and come to our text today, I'm like, I've read this before. Everything John's going to say in this chapter, uh, he's going to, he's already said in one way or another. He's going to continue to say these same things. And so John is extremely repetitive. And one of the things that he is probably the thing in all of his writings, John is the most repetitive about is discerning a real believer from a fake believer. I mean, he is OCD about this. Maybe you've noticed or asked yourself, gee, how come every sermon for the last several months is about like the real people of God versus the fake people? I said, because that's all John talks about since John 5. That's why. And so if John doesn't talk about it in the text, I won't talk about it. But as long as he keeps bringing it up, I'm going to keep bringing it up. And so when you read the book of 1 John, John, so John, who wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote Revelation. And so when you read especially 1st John, literally that entire epistle is about discerning real believers from fake believers. When you read Revelation, you have the Bride of Christ, and you have the Harlot, and they juxtapose each other. Real believers, fake believers. Since John chapter 5 in the Gospel of John, we have looked at this continual distinction between those who are really saved and those who are not. And guess what we're going to find? In, we're in chapter 8 now. Guess what we'll find in chapter 9? Same thing. Guess what we'll find in chapter 10? Same thing. Guess what we'll find in 11? Same thing. And guess what we'll find in 12? Same thing. And then chapters 13 through 17 will be one conversation with his disciples, and among them is Judas. And John's going to, and Jesus is going to draw that distinction. Like it is over and over and over again that John is incessantly telling us the differences between a real believer and a fake believer. What also is characteristic of John's writing is his obsession with who Christ is. John has some of the weightiest things in all the scripture to say about who Jesus is. So, this is the vibe I get from John, is that he's seen Christ in his glory, and he's like, bang, that is awesome. And then he looks out at people who profess his name, and then he sees the face, and he's like, what's the matter with you? Why are you faking this? And he's just earnest as he sees the glory of Christ, that the real church gets strengthened and encouraged, and that the false church is just like, bang. So, since we're going through John's teachings, and that's John's obsession, that's going to be our obsession, I guess, because uh, we're just following uh, his lead. And one of the reasons why I think John is so deeply relevant for us in the United States, is if you are at all in tune with the spiritual climate in America, you would do well to study John's writings and to take them seriously and to have a genuine grasp of his teaching so that you yourself will believe unto eternal life and so that you will not be deceived by the counterfeit Christian culture that has so deeply infiltrated our churches here in America. Yesterday, after watching Spider-Man, I won't give like... Big spoiler alerts if some of you plan to watch it, if not. But basically, Spider-Man's fighting the bad guys, and it costs him greatly. There's great triumphs, there's joys, and there's terrible suffering. And so I asked my team yesterday, I'm like, how many of you, like, live for something? And they're like, damn, <laughs> what? And I was like, how many of you have just been captured by something and you, you see it, it's like, that's it, that's it, and I want to live for it and anchor myself and I don't care what it costs me. And they just like looked at me cross-eyed. And I was like, or are you kind of at the place where, you know, just want a little comfort, don't want things to be too hard, have a nice life, and then just no hell. And almost without hesitation and even pride, we're like, yeah, that's me. 
That's where I'm at. I just don't want things to be too hard. Just kind of coast through life. And I was like, God, I'm so sorry. I just, I hate that. And I think with all that I am, the overwhelming majority of Americans who profess Christ want nothing more than a little bit of God in their life so that he can exist to make things easy for them and make things comfortable. Yeah, we'll have some challenges, nothing too bad, nice life, nice family, nice job, grow up, die, and then no hell, and then I'm fine. Jesus wants to vomit that kind of Christianity out of his mouth. It's not even Christianity. I wish people would stop calling it that. Everything, we were praying this morning at the prayer time, and I was telling them, like, everything that I want for myself and for you, I'm going to pray this for you, so you're welcome. Uh, I say it is. I want as much of Christ in this life as possible for me and for you. I want to spend my life in a way where God can use it to produce something real. Real conversions. Real growth in the saints. Do you know what it takes for that to happen? A cross. It takes persecution. You're not going to be popular. You're going to suffer all kinds of things. Betrayed, lied about, maybe beat up, maybe imprisoned, maybe tortured, maybe killed. Takes all of that. Every good thing that a real Christian could ever want is on the other side of a cross. So wait, now what are you praying for us? So I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> what are we saying? Yes. <laughs> We'll see if God answers my prayers or not. <laughs> my prayer for myself as I look at that is I'm like, I want as much of you as possible in this life. That can't happen without a cross. Lord, I want to be used to bring about real kingdom things in this life by you. That can't happen without a cross. And I want to meet you beat down and persecuted and bleeding and destroyed, but kiss your pierced feet, which are also bloody and drunk, but they're not because they're glorified, and hug as soldiers who went through war together. That's what I want. And God, help me not sin when the persecution comes. And please, you guys can pray this for me. Please, I don't want to feel sorry for myself. I am so good at that. I hate that in me. It's like it's so easy for me to feel sorry for myself. And so my prayer for me and for you guys is that we will just look at Christ and just be like, oh, that's awesome. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to have it. Whatever sin I got to leave. Whatever freedom I need to forsake and not indulge, whatever thing I need to stand up to, whatever issue I need to faithfully teach, whatever way I need to spend and pour myself out for uh, whoever, whatever slander I have to go through, unpopularity, loss of whatever relationship, loss of freedom, I gotta go to jail, I gotta suffer. I don't want those things, but if I have to, I am so gripped by how much I love you, let's do it. So I'm praying for all of us. And you will want Christ, more of Christ, every single day. More, 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 more. And be willing to go through whatever it takes to have that. And that you will want to use your life to be poured out for other people to have that. And you'll be willing to go through whatever you have to go through to have that. We'll see if he answers my prayer. Spoiler alert, he will. You know how I know? 1 John 5 says... We know if we pray anything according to God's will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the things that we ask of him. So, you're ready to be tested. Um, but praise God, man, be ready to know the Lord better. Be ready to like really actually be used to help a Christian grow in rich, wonderful, deep ways. Be ready to really actually be used to see someone come to real salvation, not the American Disneyland cotton candy fake version of it. Sweet. Praise God. Like We don't have anything to be afraid of. The one who's gone before us has already gone through all these things, and he'll be with us, and he'll carry us. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. So that actually, that was all for free. Now that's in my notes. <laughs> but why it's relevant to the sermon notes is this sermon is about fake Christianity and false Christianity. You want to be, I, 
You will be persecuted in America if you call out the fake Christianity for what it is and you tell someone they can't have this and Jesus and you demand that they repent, I guarantee you, you're going to get persecuted. And because there's so much corporate blindness in America, when you call out corporate sins, to repentance, sins, and a corporate sin is something the whole group of people is in bondage to, a whole group of people is seduced by. A corporate sin is the deadliest sin, is the deadliest, bleh, reset. Calling a corporate sin to repentance is the deadliest and most lonely thing you can ever do. And it's also awesome. <laughs> so, this the things Jesus will say to us about real Christianity and false Christianity, you must understand these things for your own salvation and also that we can take up our cross and join our betrayed, homeless, persecuted, unwealthy, despised, rejected, betrayed, wrongly imprisoned, murdered Savior on the path of redeeming souls. Okay, there we go. So, there's your setup, which is longer than some section of my study. Uh, John <laughs> chapter 8 is our text, verses 31 through 47. For those of you who like titles, the name of this sermon is Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> In the 90s? Okay, John 8. 31. I will remind you before we dig into the text, the context to our passage. It is a continuation of a conversation Jesus is having with those who are seeking to kill him. They are all natural minded. They have been hostile towards him since chapter 5. And last week we ended with verse 30. And the text told us in verse 30 that after Jesus said these things, many believed in him. Now I want you to notice the first few words of verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, read that closely. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. The fascinating thing about this statement is reading the rest of the conversation. You know what Jesus calls these people through the rest of the chapter? I'll give you a little... Uh, a little spoiler on it. Here are these people that believed in Jesus. And in the rest of the conversation, Jesus calls them liars in verse 55. He calls them those who are seeking to kill him in verse 44. He calls them children of the devil in verse 44. He calls them those who do not believe in him in verse 45. In verse 46, they are those who resist the truth. And in verse 47, they are those who are not of God. And they are also children of the, je of the devil whom he eventually frees from to avoid being murdered by them. Verses 44 and 59. This is the full description of these people who are called the Jews who had believed in him in verse 31. How do you make sense of that? There are many theories I read on. I read a commentary on this this, this week, and there are many theories on it. It just made me mad at theories. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is insane. How do you even think of this? Whatever. And I think it's pretty simple. It's really not that hard. Here's how I reconcile the statement that they're, the Jews who believed in verse 31 with everything Jesus said about them in, in the rest of chapter 8. Here's the, rec the way to reconcile it. All the way back in chapter 5, John's been disputing with these people who are the fake people of God. In chapter 6, you might remember, the fake believers initially believed Jesus was the prophet from Deuteronomy 18. They believed he was the Christ and they were ready to make him king. But chapter 6 revealed the only reason they believed in him was so that they could use him to gain earthly bread. And as soon as he only offered them himself and salvation and eternal life, they all abandoned him and proved that their faith was false. So here in chapter 8, we see the exact same phenomenon. They profess faith in verses 30 through 31. But based on how they respond to him, Jesus has these super strong pronouncements about what they really are in the rest of the chapter. He's not talking to two groups of people. He's talking to a group of people who says they believe in him, but are actually something else. They profess 
this faith, but he's going to expose that it is a sham. And what I want you to put in your heart and mind as we move through the text and go through this conversation, I want you to think about what is the love of God towards someone who thinks that they're following God and they're really not. How do you show the love of Christ to them? And I want you to see if what you think that is versus what Jesus actually does is the same. We're going to see Jesus is not overly preoccupied with not offending them. He isn't trying to keep them comfortable in their own delusions. He's going to speak the truth in such a way that they have to face the reality of who he is, of what real salvation is, and who they truly are. And in dealing with people in this way, he's showing them great love. Because facing these realities are what they desperately need if they're going to have eternal life and escape the wrath of God. This isn't a comfortable conversation, but Jesus isn't some passive coward who only wants to keep himself popular and then say, see, I'm nice to everyone because I show the love of Christ, while he just shuts his mouth and watches people walk in their delusions and go to hell. He doesn't do that. That's the American faithful guy now, is the guy who's just nice. There's nothing wrong with being nice. But the guy who's just nice, never ruffle any feathers, never make it just... Be a good little worker and just don't cause any problems. Go sit in the corner and everything you believe, whatever stupid thing you want to believe, but don't rock the boat. Let's see if that's how Jesus is. And the reason I want to mention this with Allison is no one questions if Jesus is showing the love of Jesus, right? Tell me you're not questioning that. Okay? He's always showing the love of Christ. No one's questioning his wisdom, and no one questions his methodologies. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. Here we go. Let's look at verses 31 and 32. We're going to see what Christ says is true about real believers. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you, truly are my, you are truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the first characteristic of a real believer is that they abide in the word of Christ. <clears throat> to abide in his word means to remain in his word. Unpacking this a little bit further, it's the idea of being so committed to his word, so in love with the word of God, so mastered by the word of God, that it shapes who you are at every level of your being. Your mind is full of His Word. Your heart loves the things of God according to the Word. Your heart is grieved by the very things that are out of step with the Word of God. And because this precious Word has come to dwell in you and fill you and lead you, it has given you life in such a way that it would be impossible for you to be yourself without the Word of God. So abide in the Word of God this way, it doesn't mean you know every mystery in the Bible. It doesn't mean you've memorized everything in the Bible. It doesn't even necessarily mean you've read the whole Bible yet. What it means is that your heart and your mind relate to the Word in such a way that you crave it. You want it. You set your life to be built on it. And if there's something you want, to, you need to learn, you want to learn it. And if the scripture convicts you of sin, you're like, oh, whoa, that's it? All right, cool, I repent. If the scripture shows you you're wrong, it's like, oh, whoa, I always thought it was this. But the Bible clearly says that, cool, I changed my view. And you set yourself that that's the course of your life. I'm not saying you have to be a Bible scholar for the word to abide in you. But the word abiding in you, it's this attitude and lifestyle towards the word of God that characterizes the real believer. <laughs> So I don't want you to think if you have questions about what the seven thunders of Revelation are that are sealed up, that means you don't, you're not believing. That's not what I'm saying. It's a disposition, an attitude, and a response towards the Word of God that it, it, I abide in this Word. That is a characteristic of a true believer. And if you don't care about the Word of God, or you don't like it, or you reject it, that is a terrifying reality. And I would plead with you to repent of that attitude and seek God to help you become a person who loves His Word. If you want help with that, we'd love to help you. So, characteristic number one, the Word of God abides in you. 
is, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, the, the real believer abides in the word of God. Uh, look again at verse 32. I'm going to read verse, I just want to read both again. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in me, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the result of abiding in his word, having this kind of disposition and lifestyle towards the word of God, is that the truth will set you free. Well, what's the truth? The truth is the very word you're supposed to abide in. And so if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Here's a question for you. Can the truth set you free if you don't know what it is? Nope. Cannot set you free. Lies lead to bondage. We're going to see at the end of this sermon, Satan's the father of lies. Everything about him is lies. The whole world serves him and their philosophies, their morality, and their theologies are all lies. And we are inundated with his lies constantly. And if you don't know the truth about a situ- something the Word of God talks about, it's an almost guarantee that by default you believe a lie. And if you believe a lie, you're going to be in bondage. There is one thing that frees you. It's the truth. But you cannot know the truth that you don't know. And in order to know the truth that would free you, you must know the Word of God. And when people, it grieves me so deeply, when people have any sort of theology or attitude towards the scripture, they want to leave their Bible on the shelf. It's like being in jail and there's a set of keys right on the wall to open it and get out of jail. And you have all these reasons to why you won't touch the keys. Do you know how blessed we are in America? How many Bibles do you have in your house? A lot. A lot, okay. <laughs> do you know that in China, I have a friend that I led to Christ who is who smuggles Bibles to China. Some churches huddle around three pages of Scripture because it's all they have. And yet many Americans have 20, and they have 20 Bibles in their house. I guess those Bibles, they are mint condition. And they have been in pristine condition for decades. You know why? They never get open. The best Bible in the world is full apart. Like the bindings all jacked up. There's coffee stains on it. You know, it covers all warped. Like you don't go anywhere without it because it's who you are. It, it frees you. It's truth. It is like, ah, oh, yes, I love this. You know, Harriet Tubman said, she had, when she was freeing slaves, she said she could have freed a lot more slaves. She could have just convinced them they were slaves. And America's crawling with slaves who are behind bars. They are behind the bars of Satan's lies, and they're abolished to sin, they're abolished to unbelief, they're abolished to falsehood, and they're set to keys all over the wall. And they're like, I'm not in jail. If you would be a true disciple, then you must be mastered by the truth, the truth that will set you free. And certainly, if you ever have any desire to help free other people, you can't free people with keys that you don't know exist. Where's my keys? That is a great sin of mine. I never know where my keys are. There's this dude in our house that like, he comes and he steals my keys all the time. But he's like the most repentant guy in the world because he always puts them back like exactly where I left them. And it's like, it's, I mean, that guy's very repentant. Whatever. This, I'm getting off track. You have to know the truth and the truth will set you free. So how does the truth set you free? Number one, the truth of the gospel sets you free from the wrath of God. When you come to know Christ, who died for your sins and rose from the dead, and you receive him through faith and repentance, you are now free. You are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You're not under Satan's dominion anymore. You're not the seed of the serpent. You become a child of God, and you are free. You have the freedom of salvation. You're free from the wrath of God. That's the first way the truth sets you free. 
The second way the truth sets you free is all the lies about what God requires, all the lies about who God is, all the lies about what it means to serve Him, what it means to repent, what it means to follow Him, what it means to love Him, what it means to honor Him. That comes in the rest of the pages of Scripture. And as you know this truth, it sets you free from the lies that go around about what God is and about what He requires. Truth in all of its Revelation, according to the scripture, will set you free in countless ways, over and over and over again. I think the third way the truth sets you free is just also knowing like the truth of situations. Does it deeply grieve anyone else entangled the Disney movie when Rapunzel's standing there on the shore being lied to by her evil, demonic, lying mom? And I, think, I can't remember her boyfriend's name. He's like tied to the boat or whatever, and it's like sailing away. And she's like, see, he's leaving me. He's leaving you, you know? And so I, mean, I don't remember the exact words. It's been a long time since I've seen it. But what I hate about that scene is she's sitting here listening to her mom who's lying about her boyfriend, and he's telling her your boyfriend doesn't really care about you, and there's this lie, this boat floating across, and she thinks her boyfriend's leaving her. And she's believing the lie. And her heart is just breaking. And she's like, wait a second, I thought he loved me. And she sees this thing she's so convinced of, but she gets in this bondage of despair because she believes a lie about the situation. It's not true. And so when you believe lies about situations, you're always going to be in bondage. And so there's the truth sets us free in the gospel for salvation. Theological truths about God and all the scripture sets us free to understand things rightly. And then there's situations. Sometimes we can believe something wrongly about a situation that puts us in like this prison. And so it's important that as we go through life, we labor to understand the truth of situations so that we don't end up in bondage believing something false, believing something, you know, maybe believing a Christian hates you when they don't, they just had a bad day, uh, they had nothing to do with you, or, you know, whatever. You go on and on and on. The truth sets us free. And we have to be people committed to the truth and people who love the truth because the Word of God is the truth, and the Son of God is the truth. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Father, your Word is truth. So the truth sets you free. <clears throat> now as we return to the text, rather than finding freedom and life in what Jesus is saying, this group of liars is offended by the truth. Now remember, these are the believers from verse 31. Verse 33. They answered him, We're offspring of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So, all right, Genesis class. Here, their boast is that they are descendants of Abraham. And as such, they believe they have a claim on Abrahamic promises of a kingdom and conquest over their enemies. And they also believe that Jesus is talking about physical, earthly slavery. And being so confident in their religious heritage, and being so convinced that they're of the right race, and seeing as how they've never been earthly slaves, they're totally offended that Jesus is suggesting that they need to be set free. How can you say free men need to be set free? What's the matter with you? That's their objection. So, let's look at the response of Jesus and we'll see more clearly what he's talking about. Jesus answered that, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Please let that verse arrest you if it hasn't already. The one who practices sin, the sad reality for that person is that they are a slave to sin. Bondage in every way is the price you will pay for sin if you will not repent of it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. I saw this Facebook thing that said sin would be a lot more appealing if you had to pay the wages for it right away. <laughs> <laughs> when I say a lot more appealing, a lot less appealing. There you go. So all my heresies, make sure you correct me whether I do or not. I have a poppy thing and call Satan the Savior or whatever. Um, Bondage comes to you in every way. It's the price you'll pay if you practice sin and won't repent. There is a great bondage. There, there's all kinds of there's moral bondage. There's this moral failure to sin. 
And as you continue to practice it, the moral bondage that comes to you is just more and more stuff to rot you from the inside out over and over and over again. Quick example. I talked to a man seven, eight years ago who told me he had a pornography addiction. And, I, and he was just kind of, yeah. And I warned him to his face. I was like, if you do not crucify this, you are going to be blown away at what this does to you. He kept playing with it, playing with it, playing with it. And he just kept twisting and rotting and killing them. And two years later, he started telling me about all these bizarre perversions that he had you. And I, I, yeah, I reminded him, I was like, I told you. I said, I talked to you about this two years ago. I told you it was going to turn you into a monster. And now here you are. You get playing and you wouldn't take it seriously. It makes you in bondage. And it is so deep now, you don't even recognize yourself. <laughs> It unrepentant sin is going to enslave you over and over and over again. If it's unrepentant theological sin, stubborn heresies you hold to about God, you know what's going to happen? You keep nursing that. You keep rejecting clear scriptures that contradict your theological lies. You know what's going to happen? Eventually you get handed over to it. And you get so far gone in it that it's like you can't repent anymore. <laughs> You're just enslaved to this lie. Or maybe you have the issue of actually being a liar. Maybe it starts off telling little white lies, or you tell half the story and not the other half, so you can fundamentally change the picture and present it how you want. And you start lying little by little, and you become a bigger and bigger and bigger liar, so much so that what can eventually happen to you, and I have seen this happen many times, you get so deceived by your lies that you believe them. That is the worst place you can possibly be. I want you, I'm going to read a passage to you. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. This is about the end times and the coming of the man of lawlessness and how bad things will get. And in this passage, Paul also goes out of his way to tell us, by the way, the mystery of this lawless stuff, it's already at work. But I want you to read what God will eventually dictate to you if you will not repent of your sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Now look at the conjunction of verse 11. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. I would love to see a poll of how many Americans believe that if you persist in unbelief and in suppressing the truth, God will eventually send you a strong delusion for the purpose of you believing that strong delusion so you can be condemned. How many people believe that about God? That is exactly what it says here. Tremble. This is a very sobering reality. You can nibble and play so long with your sin. And here's all the times you get convicted. And you have every excuse in the world for why you won't leave your sin. And here's the truth. You keep suppressing it, suppressing it, suppressing it. You keep going after this unrighteousness. Eventually, God will be like, okay, there you go. Have it. He will hand you over. You will believe your own lies all the way into his wrath. If that doesn't give you an earnestness to repent, I can't think of anything more frightening to appeal to than that. God will judge you by handing you over to the thing that you keep pursuing. Uh, you keep pursuing. Uh, Anyone who sins is a slave 
to sin. He will practice the sin. Take that very seriously. So, if you have sin in your life, confess it to God. Trust the cross. will forgive it. Declare war on your sins. And repent. Do whatever you have to do to repent. It's not worth it. It is not worth it. The slavery and bondage is not worth it. Don't you love like when you repent that feeling of like, ha, ah, like freedom, where it's like, feel like you just took a bath or something, you know, like, and it's just like, ah, you feel you again. You feel joyful. You feel free again. You know why you feel free? Because you were in bondage when you were not repenting. So, not only is the key to get you out of the prison of bondage, the truth of the word of God, it is also repentance. Okay. The one who refuses repentance. Jesus has some powerful things to say in the next two verses. Let's look at verses 35 and 36. And, uh... <coughs> Before we do, I want to show you, as Abraham's physical descendants, the people Jesus is talking to, they think being a child of Abraham alone makes them sons of God and eternal members of God's household. And I want you to listen to how Jesus is going to love them by trying to remove these false hopes that they have. Verse 35 and 36. The slave doesn't remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Jesus has got done telling them, whoever practices sin is a what? Slave. Now he tells them in verse 35 and 36, he's going to use a cultural analogy to drive home this spiritual truth. In a household during this time, there were obviously the parents, and there were children, and there were household servants called slaves. Now the slave of the household didn't live in the house forever. There would come a time where the slave would be let go and was no longer in the home. But the sons, the children of the household, they're members of the family forever. That's what Jesus is talking about. He uses this analogy in their culture about what a typical household is like. And so here in the analogy, Jesus is showing these people that they are slaves. They're slaves to sin. And if they're not free through Christ's word, they're going to stay slaves to sin, and they will be removed from the household of God, just like their earthly slave was at that time. But if they will savingly believe in Jesus, then Jesus as the Son, who remains forever in God's house, Jesus as the Son will make them free. And so to these Jews, this is deeply offensive talk. They believe that being Jewish and physical descendants of Abraham, that's all they need to be eternal sons in God's household. But so far we've seen that in order for them to be real children of God, they have to abide in Christ's word, they must know and believe the truth, and they must be set free by the true Son of God. So... There is a great power that conquers sin and frees slaves and turns slaves into sons who remain in God's household forever. And the power, according to this passage, it's Christ's word, it is the truth, and it is Christ himself. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Verse 36. You cannot separate the word of Christ from the truth and from Christ himself. You can't separate those things. You have one, You have all of those things or you have none of them. They all stand and fall together. And so through the word of God and the truth of all things, the son of God frees slaves and turns them into children. And so if these Jews or anyone else will not turn to Christ and not turn to the truth and receive it, then they will be slaves Forever, and Jesus loves them enough to help them see that they're not what they think they are. Now, in the next two verses, Jesus is going to continue to strip away their hopes of thinking that they're okay with God simply because they're Abraham's physical offspring. Let's look at verse 37 38. 
I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. So here, Jesus concedes that they are, in fact, physical descendants of Abraham. Yeah, I know you're Abraham's children. However, he then goes on to expose their murderous intentions. He tells them they're seeking to kill him in the name of serving the God of Abraham. And there are two stated reasons of why they want to kill him. First, they want to kill him because his word finds no place in them. They hate his message, they hate his teaching on what it means to really follow God, and they especially hate his claims about himself. Everything about them is given to rejecting Christ's word, and as a result, they want to eliminate him, even though they are believers. And so here is another key characteristic of false believers. When the word of God clearly shines on issues of sin or issues of life that they don't want to deal with, the game players will twist his word, they will reject his word, they will ignore his word, and they will rebel against it. They have this attitude that they're annoyed with the Bible. They resent the Bible. They want to hear the Bible. And they're constantly finding ways to suppress it while they delight in every worldly thing that the wisdom of this age has to offer as an alternative to God's truth. Their attitude towards God's word is not, it's fire in my bones. It's more precious than silver and gold. I must have the word. That is not their attitude. Instead, their attitude is that they're just annoyed by it. And, and they're like, oh, I mean, yeah, the Bible, I know I should read it, but, you know, this, or hey, it's not about the Word of God, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't have to have a Bible. Well, what are you saying? I've got to be a Bible scholar in order to know God? Oh, i got to know everything in the Bible according to you, or I'm not a Christian. They have all stupid attitudes. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that nonsense come out of people's mouths. And I want to tell you something about all of the people I've ever heard say that stuff. When I look at them and they have that attitude and they never change that attitude, they stay with that attitude towards the word, not one of them have I ever looked at their life and been like, wow, I want to know God like that. I have never felt that way. Ever. And I'm guessing you haven't either. I have known those precious brothers and sisters who treasure the word. And it's just in them. And it's just coming out of them. And they're like, yo, oh, I like they have these wonderful, sweet attitudes towards the word. And guess what their life looks like? It's the aroma of Christ. And I've been like, man, I want to know the Lord like that. You know, for a birthday, like I think about Carissa with this. I don't know if she's in here. But like Carissa is so like that. It's like Carissa will have like one kid in one hand and like get some out of the diaper bag in another hand. She's like overhearing some like really deep theological conversation. It's like, I want to hear that. And like you, you walk over and it's like, okay, I'm trying to feed Caleb and stir the pot and I'm holding like an RC Sproul book in my hand or something. You know, it's just, it's just like she just has this tenacious disposition towards I love the word of God. And I would gladly tell my daughters, hey, that is a faithful example to imitate and be like that. But her attitude towards the Word of God is nothing like the stuff that I just explained. Totally different. And so if you don't know it, great, that's okay. But don't have this attitude toward it the rest of your life that you're going to justify staying there. Don't do that. And so here are these fakes. They dis they dis Buys his word, and all they want is they want you know, uh, people like this. These guys don't know about the cross yet, but people who are like them, they want the benefits of the cross, but they don't have any real love for the one who was actually crucified. These types of people, they're not saved. Now, the second stated reason from the text why these people hate Jesus and want to kill him is because they want to do what they have heard from their father. So he says in verse 38. Now here their boast is their children of Abraham. They make it as boast to their father. He's like, nah, you want to do what your father, you want to do what you've heard from your father. And in a moment, we're going to see he's talking about Satan. 
And so he tells them they want to kill him just like Satan does. And again, if you're a student of your Bible, this should not be a surprise to hear at all because God promised in Genesis 3.15 there was going to be hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And here it is. Jesus, as the seed of the woman, is talking to the seed of the serpent. And what do you see? Hostility. They want to kill him. Like, it's not a surprise. That's been unfolding all the way since the garden. And so, through their hatred of Christ, and through their hatred of truth, and their hatred of the word, that they're proving out that they are of the same spiritual quality as the devil, and therefore they're seed of the serpent. But they're saying, oh, we came from Abraham. And so, when you're dealing with a fake Christian, which is what these guys example or exemplify, jeez, I'm off my game today. Um, what these guys exemplify, when you're dealing with a fake Christian, be ready to give it. Here's how they respond in verses 39 and 40. They answered him, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said, all right, if Abraham were your children... You would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That's not what Abraham did. Now let me ask you, if you're dealing with a bunch of fakes, and they said, well, I love Jesus. And there's clearly something happening right there to prove they didn't. Would you have the courage to be like, really? You love Jesus? That's why you're drunk? Because you love him so much, that's not what Jesus did. That's not what the word says. Would you have the courage to tell him that? Hopefully the answer is yes. I told a guy that one time at a party. He almost drowned me in a pool. Uh, but, <laughs> but I want you to see what he's doing. They're boasting. Oh, man, we're children of Abraham. He's like, oh, really? Really? Okay, let's take that claim. He proves right here, they're not true children of Abraham. Unlike Abraham, they reject the truth that Christ is preaching about Christ, or about God. Unlike Abraham, they are the seed of the serpent, and they're hostile towards Christ and trying to kill him. Abraham didn't do this. We're studying Genesis right now. Where is Abraham ever doing this? He's not. He's not perfect, but he is never rejecting God's truth. Sometimes he has questions and he wrestles, but then he receives the answer God gives him. He's never settled and hostile in opposing the truth and trying to kill Sarah, you know, or whatever, whatever, because she put it He's never doing that. And these guys are saying, oh yeah, we're children of Abraham. He's like, oh really? How come you act nothing like him then? And so... Here, Christ is doing what these people desperately need. He's exposing the fact that they are false. It doesn't matter that they're physically Abraham's seed, because spiritually they're the serpent's seed. Now, I don't know anyone in my life who's ever come to a church I've attended and said, I'm good with God because I'm a Jew. I've never, met, I've never had that conversation. But in our day and age, how can people make the same boast? How do Americans make the same boast? We're children of Abraham. I have a Bible in my house. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. I've been baptized. Yeah. I go to church. Okay. I, I walked an aisle and accepted Jesus into my heart. Okay. I go to church on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely down when you do that. Anyone else? My family are all believers. Mm -hmm. My family is all believers. I'm the first believer in my family. Okay. So, when you listen to all these things, when you're discerning someone's testimony, first thing I do when I meet a Christian is I want to hear them put in their own words how they come to know the Lord and what their walk's like. And I've met many people who put their testimony into the words of, it's just other people. It's everything around them. Well, my family's a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I grew up Christian. We, we, you know, we always went to church. You know, we did these things. And my grandpa was a pastor. And, um, you know, my mom, she reads her Bible every year. And, man, she prays all the time. But my mom is so godly, you know, and stuff. So, and I'm listening, and I'm like, there is nothing in that about your own walk with Christ. Nothing. Those things are all good things. But they can't save you. I'm glad you have a mom 
that is on fire for God. But if you don't walk with God, all that's going to do for you is make hell worse. Being exposed to so much light and still rejecting it. So here's the characteristic, another characteristic of the false Christian. The fraud has a tendency to hope in his ancestors or his family members or some sort of social connection. He hopes in their status with God as applied to him. My dad's a Christian, so I'm a Christian too. I say, you know, all, all these different things that we just talked about. Listen, you have to realize this. A family member, a pastor, a friend, they cannot walk with God for you. They cannot believe for you. They can't know the truth for you. They can't repent for your sins. They can't make you love Jesus. You must do this yourself. You have to have faith. You have to know the word. You have to repent of your sins. You have to love Jesus. People around you can help you grow in that, but they can't do it for you. It's a lot like being a coach. A coach cannot play the game for you. They can help you, but they can't do it for you. Similarly, your parents, your siblings, your friends, your church, your pastor, your whoever, they might be great examples of the faith for you, but they cannot do it for you. You have to do it yourself. You must walk with Christ yourself. And so, a huge characteristic of false Christianity is hoping you're okay with God because people around you are, even though you don't really want them. I've seen that many times. And I'm guessing you have too. And I want to give a caveat. If people around you were a really good example of Christ, and that really opened your eyes and helped you see God, praise God for that. Like you should be thankful for that. But it just, people can't walk with God for you. Sometimes when people make this point I'm making, they like bash Christian homes and churches and, you know, all this stuff. I was like, that's not what should happen. These are good things. They can be lights and pointers to Christ, but eventually you got to take that light and example and go to Christ yourself. They can't be Christians for you. So, false Christians basically take other people's faith and make it their own when it isn't their own. <laughs> All right. Let's keep examining the conversation, verses 41 to 43. Jesus tells them, you're doing the works your father did. And they said, we're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I came from God and I'm here. And I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. And so now here as the conversation progresses, the hypocrites are going to boast not only is Abraham their father, but also God is their father. And Jesus uses the same logic he used towards their claim about Abraham as their father to dismantle their claim that God is their father. And here he tells them, if God was really your father, then your actions would be consistent with God's. In this case, Jesus says, you would love me because I'm his son and he sent me, but you hate me. Nobody who is a true child of God hates Jesus. And so you can say all day long, oh yeah, God's my father, but if you hate Christ, no, he's not. And in verse 43, Jesus tells them the reason they are so blind, the reason they're so deeply deceived by their own falsehood, again, it's tied to the way in which they relate to his word. Look at verse 43. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. This is another fascinating verse. Like the things Jesus is saying, it's like really not that complicated. But like they just can't get it. He's like, dude, why is it? You know, like the gratitude, oh, why are you so hard to talk to? Like, well, why do you not get this? There's one reason. They hate his word. Here is another staggering warning about a lifestyle that is hostile to the Word of God. You can give yourself over to rejecting His Word so much that pretty soon 
you would even be able to understand the plain things that Christ says. Rejecting truth and reality and who God is in Christ, it has a way of making a person go insane with spiritual blindness. Reject it long enough, rebel against it long enough, ignore it enough, and you will literally be transformed into a hardened madman. And so I plead with you to love his word and anchor everything you are in it so that you won't suffer this fate. Maybe you've experienced, I know I've experienced exactly what he's talking about where I have been talking to fake Christians, and I'm like, no, this is boom, 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 boom. One plus one equals two. And they're like, no, oh, the quadratic of formula in Chinese equals ice hockey. And you're like, what? <laughs> People become crazy through the settled, hardened attitude of rejecting the word of Christ. Do not go there. Now the next verse, Jesus is going to dive deeper into his explanation of why these people who think they are believers and are not, he's going to go deeper into his explanation as to why they are in fact the children of Satan. Verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character because he's a liar and the father of lies. So to begin this claim, in this verse, this is a really long verse. To, it, it, he makes a statement to start the verse, and we have this claim. They are of their father, Satan. And then he brings evidence to the claim. And the evidence is that they, uh, it, it, the children of Satan is evidenced by it, the fact that their will is to do his desires. They have no, we've already seen, they have no love for Jesus, they have no appetite for the truth, and they are blinded by lies and they want to eliminate. And so, <clears throat> here's his claim. You are of your father Satan, and now here's the evidence. The rest of the verse is proving out their children of the devil. And he proves it out by reminding them Satan was a murderer from the beginning. What's he talking about? Okay, that's part of it. What came, What death came before? That's the first like actual death recorded in the Bible from a physical standpoint. But even prior to that. In the garden, the deception that led to death. Exactly. Satan's lies. God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the day you eat of it, what shall happen? You will die. And so they ate, and death came to them immediately. Spiritual death, and then with Cain and Abel, physical death. It's the first thing that happens outside of the, outside of, uh, the garden, is murder. Satan's a murderer from the beginning. He's a killer in every way. And he's killed us. He wants to kill you in at least three ways. The first way that we are dead is spiritual. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says we're dead in trespasses and sin. When you're born, you're not a good person. You're evil. And I am evil when we're born. We're spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead in our sin. We're separated from God. That's death number one. Death number two is when your body actually dies and goes in the ground. Death number three, Revelation 20, calls being thrown into the lake of fire the second death. Which in some ways is really the third time. Uh, but there's three ways Satan murders you. Dead in your sin, separated from God, dead in your body, dead eternally. He is a killer. Every bit of death that has touched this earth, Satan has had his filthy fingerprints all over it. He's a murderer from the beginning. That's what he's about. And what are these people trying to do to Jesus? Murder him. And so Satan's a murderer, and he's hostile towards the seed of the woman who is Christ. And now here comes these little bad guys, and they come along, and they want to murder too, and they're hostile towards the seed of the woman. Then what are they? Children of the devil. They're acting exactly like him. And we also see in this verse 
And Jesus called Satan the father of lies. And Jesus said when Satan lies, he's speaking his native language, and there's no truth in him whatsoever. He is the ultimate slave to falsehood. If Satan is talking, he's lying. And lying is his most powerful weapon of choice in his murderous campaign against the human race. More powerful than a nuclear bomb are the lies of Satan. It all came through lies. Told Eve, you will be his God. You won't die. He lied. Boom. Adam believed the same lie. Bang. Now every death, spiritually, physically, and eternally that has ever taken place has come through its origin, the lies of Satan. Lies are profound murder weapons. And Satan is a liar. All that he does is lie. And he's, he lies in a lot of different ways. He just straight up makes things up. He flatly denies things. Or more than that, like he did in the garden, he twists things. Lies come from Satan. And so those who are his human children, not only are they going to be characterized by a murderous hostility towards Christ and his real people, but they are also, also going to be deeply characterized by falsehood. They see things darkly. They twist things into something that they're not. They completely fabricate things to drive their agenda. Or they flat out deny the truth of situations when it gets in the way of them gratifying their flesh. Or they just adjust them and spin it and try to make you feel crazy. And they'll say, hey, <clears throat> Jeremiah, I hate you. And you'll be like, bro, why do you hate me? The Bible says I said, oh, no, no, that's just what you thought. You misunderstood me. I said, I hate food. And you're like, uh, what? And it's like it's satanic, demonic, little twisty liars are always shifting and changing everything. And they're, they're, they're like magicians. They're like, here's one picture, and then you kick back on the picture. Oh, wait, no, 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 here's the next picture. Oh, here's the next picture. Here's the next picture. Here, buy a comb. Oh, here's mirrors. Oh, I have shown you comb. That wasn't combs. That was popsicles. They're not mirrors. That's a good pair of shoes. Like, uh, you misunderstand everything. Uh, playing on your head and twisting your brain and trying to get you to chase your tail and doubt yourself. And, and I hate it, as you could probably tell. <laughs> this is why I don't care what your profession of faith is. When I interact with you and your habit is lying and twisting, do you know what my Bible tells me about that? What does verse 44 tell you about that? I don't care what your theology is. Who's the father of lies? Satan. And what do his children do? Wow. Regardless of what their theology is, when you are given over to this, this is what's true about you. Real Christians lie, or the real Christians repent if they tell a lie. Lie for your teeth. <laughs> My uncle, like, <laughs> 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 at least I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> 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 yeah, but a real Christian tells a lie, they repent for their lie. <laughs> Fake Christians twist and lie about everything so that they control everything to drive their earthly agenda. That's what fake Christians say. And I don't give a rip what their theology is. As soon as God exposes you, that's the quality of person you are, I have zero trust for you, and I'm a child of the devil. That's a scary thing for a lot of American Christians. I've met a lot of Christians who have a theology that can save someone that are straight up liars like this. If you're a liar, you're a child of the devil. These are Jesus' words. Okay. Having fun? <laughs> it's... Nice light topic for today. Uh, let's let's keep going. Verse forty-five. So, all right, here, here, sum up in, in verse forty-four. You're children of the devil. Why? Because you devil's a murderer, and you want to murder me. The devil's a liar, and you are a liar. Therefore, you're just like the devil. That's what he's saying in verse forty-four. Doesn't matter if they believe there's one God. It doesn't. Even the devil believes that and trembles. James says. Verse forty-five. 
Here Jesus says, Because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is that you are not of God. Because they're so deeply bound by lies, like their father the devil, they can't receive the word of truth that comes from Jesus. Lies and truth are totally incompatible. Just like being a murderer and a giver of life are incompatible. Just like Christ and Satan are incompatible. Just like real followers of Christ and followers of Satan are incompatible. And in verses 45 through 47, Jesus reminds them, nobody can justly convict Christ of sin. He says, which one of you convicts me of sin? And in this context, it's especially the sin of lying that's in view. But it's any sin. He's like, who can accuse me of sin? And Jesus then asked them, why do you reject, why do they reject him if he tells them the truth? And in verse 47, he gives the answer at the deepest level, why they're so murderous, why they're in love with lies. Here's why, verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is because you're not of God. Bang. This entire section has been showing us. Someone's attitude and responsiveness towards the word of God says everything about them. This is exactly what Jesus says. The reason why they don't receive his message and his words is because they're not God. They're children of the devil. Children of the devil will never receive the word of God. Unless God is transforming them and saving them in that moment, they will never receive it. So, because this passage is so clearly dealing with false people of God, we need to examine ourselves. In my opinion, it is resoundingly clear that the key characteristics of real believers, it's not that they're sinless, it's not that they know everything. Instead, their genuine faith is seen in their attitude and response to Christ, His Word, and the truth. I think that has been very clear. Uh, in this passage. Those three things are so linked, you cannot have one without the other. And so the true man or woman of God is in a lifelong pursuit of God because they love God. They're in a lifelong love affair with the Word of God because they love God. And there's someone who wants to deal with the things of life according to the truth of what things really are. How many people ignore things because it's not what they want to think is true? The person of truth doesn't do that. The child of God is not going to do that. It's like, you know what? I wish this wasn't true, but i got to deal with things according to how they are, not how I want them to be. Because they love truth. And that can be a painful thing. But you know what? It's not easy to be a Christian. If you want to be real yourself, and you want to labor for something real, you have to face what is actually true. You have to come to God, you have to respond to God, you have to respond to His Word, you've got to constantly be adjusting your life according to the Word of God, or remaining true in the Word of God, and dealing with situations according to the truth of what they are, by the power of the truth of His Word, because you're preaching the Christ who is the truth. That's a lot of truthy statements. Got it? <laughs> The real believer always is trying to grow, grow closer to the real Christ. They want to grow closer to other believers who have the same heart and the same mind. Look, the fake, the, the, the fakes, they're trying to eliminate Christ out of their life, the real one. Well, if they want to remove Christ out of their life, who else do you think they want to remove from their life? This isn't in the text, but this comes later in John. The true Christians. They're always trying to remove them out of their life. And they start surrounding themselves with false gods, with false Christs, and the false people of God, who are all hypocrites like that. Hypocrites ignore the word, they twist the word, deny the word, rebel against the word, they live in falsehood, and they lie about things. And they're always pushing away the real Jesus, and they fabricate some Santa Claus American version of Jesus that they think is the real one. And they're pushing away the people who most love the Word of God because just being in their presence can fix them. And he's like, dude, go away. 
all kinds of ways. They'll ghost you, they, they might kill you, they might beat you up, they might tell you off, they might just start ignoring you, all that stuff, because your presence as a real Christian, whether you're sometimes, whether you're trying to or not, exposes their hypocrisy, and they don't want that. Cockroaches hate the light. They gotta go run under a log. And when you turn logs over and the light shines, you see the roaches scatter, but the moths all fly to light. So be a moth and not a cockroach. Uh, <laughs> here, in closing, I'm going to issue out, because this passage is largely a warning passage, I'm going to end with warnings. If you're doing this, please respond to it. If you're not doing this, but you know someone is who is, here's an example of how to work. Put away lies. Put away falsehood. Embrace the truth of your need for Christ. Embrace the truth of the gospel. Embrace the truth of his word. And embrace the truth of whatever's going on in your life. So I'm learning about all those things. Then in faith and repentance, plant your entire being in your ways and what you love and your joys and your purpose and aim in life. Plant it directly in the Son of God. Plant it directly in the word. And plant it directly in truth as you flee falsehood and surround yourself with real believers. If you continue to seek to murder the real Christ out of your life, if you continue to seek to murder in various ways the real believers out of your life, if you love and cherish falsehood, and if you build your life off of lies and constantly suppress the truth of God's word while you live in the bondage of lying, you will not only prove that you're a child of the devil, but you will also suffer the same fate as him. And don't take my word for it. Revelation 21 8 it talks about the new heavens and the new earth. And then it talks about who's not there. Revelation 21 8. As for the cowardly, I haven't even touched that. Don't get me started on that one. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and get this, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Revelation 21 8. Need more? Okay. Revelation 21 15, just a few verses later. Here's what it says about the new heavens and the new earth, and who won't be in there. Nothing unclean will ever enter, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. But only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Need more? Okay. Your wish is my command. Revelation 22, 15. We haven't even looked at the new earth yet. Tells us what characterizes those who will not be in glory with Christ and who will be in the lake of fire. Here's what it says. Outside of the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This is the word of God. If you're characterized by lies, you know you know you're lying. God knows you're lying, and though you might get away with it in this life. I just read to you what the eternal outcome will be of your falsehood. Repent and turn to the Savior before it's too late. He is true. He is the truth. His words are the truth. He sees all things. He'll judge all things by the truth. And so you have to leave the bondage of sin and the bondage of lies because you know if you are given over to lies, you are exhausted from trying to keep up with all of them. You know it. Come to the one who will transform you from a slave into a son. He will transform you from a liar to a person of truth. He will transform you from a child of Satan into a child of Christ. Do not lose your soul for your lies. It's not worth it. Next week, this conversation.
conversation continues. So bring your seatbelt and buckle in for that one because it gets a lot better. <laughs> it's just the beginning. <laughs> but we have to love all the Word of God. Not just Romans 8 28. So, questions or comments? I just couldn't help but think where you're talking. You know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So, so yeah, if you want the way, then you want truth. You want eternal life, you want truth, you want Christ, you want all those things, the way, the truth, and the life. To, to murder the truth is to murder your life, your eternity, Christ, you know, it, it all goes together. Um, yeah, by, by murdering the, the truth, which is what these hypocrites were doing, they were denying the true Christ. I mean, isn't it just so much easier to just repent? <laughs> I mean, just, just repent, man. Isn't it? Yeah. Jeremiah? Yeah. Um, we were reading at Matthew last night where Christ says to his disciples, like, look, they called me, you know, they said that I was serving the Prince of Jesus. How much, you know, will they treat you any different? And I know a, a lot of the stuff, like, if, if you read generally a Christian youth discipleship literature, it'll define persecution in, well, people will think you're a dweeb because you won't go out and smoke weed. Dude, I have not even heard the word. Are you even old enough to say that? At least the literature I've seen, it doesn't prepare you for, look, if you follow Christ, even the visible people of God will say you're serving Satan. Yep. It's true. Um, I had a thought when you were talking at the beginning about the difficult part of being a Christian and that. Um, there, like the, I wrote this thing down that was happening, we were talking about at school. Um, when you know your why, you can handle the how. Huh? So if you know the bigger purpose, the why are you getting up in line, like you said, living for something versus just, you know, that's your why. So the how to go through it day by day, um, it can empower you because you know your why. Oops. Totally true. I went off in the bedroom last night to my daughters about this and I was like, look, wanting to do the right thing is not enough. You do the right thing, the persecution's going to come, and eventually it'll seat you up. If, if at the deepest level, all you want is, I just want to do the right thing, no, no, you got to have something deeper than that. It has to be love. It's got to be love for Christ. you got to have, he's got to be the why. Like, I, I just love him. I, I just, I just love him. And because I love him, I want to do the right thing. And because I love him, I'll go through the cost of doing the right thing. But love is what's going to keep me here. Your why, they tell you in Navy SEAL training, your why has to be big enough for all the suffering they put you through. And they quit, and when they quit, they often say, his why wasn't big enough. And your why in life has got to be love for Christ. And so I, I like it. Yeah. Actually, when they quit in SEAL training, um, when they go back to the fleet, they do all the dirty work because they quit. It's like scraping off paint, cleaning the bathrooms all the time. Exactly. It's a good picture of eternal humiliation for Chuck in the face. <laughs> but I mean, like, SEAL training connects to Christianity a lot. Because, like, if you're willing to suffer and you never quit, then Christ is going to be with you. Like, he's your teammate. But if you quit on your teammate, he's going to quit on you. It's my guy. Me and you, Brandon, we have a Navy SEAL day. I got all these <laughs> Navy SEAL movies that I like to watch for that exact reason. <laughs> I love to watch the picture of it play out. No. Anyone else? You might have touched on it, but I think it's interesting at the beginning of um, verse 31 where it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, like, he's just exposing, I don't know what they believed yeah. before, yeah. but they had believed yeah. in him. But Something to come of not exactly. believing. Exactly. We don't have as much details. We do in John 6. We know it was about bread. 
But I, I had a, a similar, like when I was looking at it, I was like, I wonder why they believe, what, what would they believe? Like he doesn't yeah. elaborate. And right. I'm like, so that's yeah, so why I, I didn't speculate on because I don't, I don't know. I didn't. But yeah, look here how it's like, they believe. And then look where we're at now. <laughs> like, and we're only halfway done with a conversation. Sam wants to get a shirt that says, be like a cockroach. Yeah, well, be like a mom. Be like a mom. Like with Sam. He's already done it all. Changing right. teams. Nice. Be a mom. I saw a shirt that was like, totally like, 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 since you have serious, I would, I would love I it. just saw it on the person in the store, so I get it. Someone in the store. It's gotta be on. Yeah. That's gotta be someone. I'll have to do this. Yeah. The spirit of games. It's a good one. Anyone else? I always think it's interesting how in the past if they want to attribute their righteousness to a sinner. I like they have this sin with the Abraham. And then there's this sinless man right there that's ultimately loving him, all these things, and they, like, hate him, but they're saying how legitimate they are because they're, it's just insane. Like, it's upside down and backwards, according to everything that they already know. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, that's a great point. <laughs> that is the insanity of serving the dog. You know, you're mad, you become a mad man. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. Anyone else? Doki, well, ar- I would arm yourself with these scriptures because I guarantee you, you're going to come across this in American Christianity, and you'll have some passages to get yourself persecuted. So, uh, <laughs> like, you might be used to save somebody. Maybe you only need this salvation. Anyways, all right, let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for sending your son to save us. Lord Jesus, I just, I love how you are. I love just what a lion you are in this passage, and you just do not flinch. You are true, you are right, you are just, you are bold. You, you I mean, you just in the, in the earlier in the chapter forgave the repentant adulterers, and they deal with these dudes like this. I just love this full picture of you. It is so awesome, and I pray, God, that you would make each one of us more and more like you, God, and, uh, God, we know we will never be those things apart from your grace and the work of your spirit. We will serve the devil. Uh, We don't want to. We want to serve you. And Father, I just pray that you will be with us in a special way and give us grace to endure whatever it is that gives us the maximum amount of Christ in our life and makes us maximally useful in your kingdom. And that will lead to you hugging us, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us, God, to do this. Lord, thank you so much. Uh, for this sweet body of believers, Lord, I pray uh, that you will bless our time in fellowship. Thank you for the food that you're going to provide and help us to strengthen each other in your grace. Love you, Lord. Praise you.